Between now and Labor Day, we are going to be digging into the book of Colossians. So I would encourage you, if you haven't read Colossians in a while, or just want to dig into it with us, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1 this week and next week, and we're just going to keep pressing through. So you can read Colossians a whole mess of times between now and Labor Day. And uh, we look forward to seeing what it is that we can learn together. Colossians is an awesome book. It's uh, uh, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. He, he is talking to them, uh, these folks who, who it is believed are, are, is located in one of the quote-unquote least significant places that Paul wrote to. But it's an incredible message that uh, God has given to us about the supremacy of Christ and who he is in relationship with us. So as we get into this, uh, this book together, this letter together, it's my prayer that uh, Jesus would encounter our lives in a, in a powerful way. As you find Colossians chapter 1, I wanted to thank those of you who uh, prayed for me last week as I spoke at the Pittsburgh District Teen Camp. It was a great week. And if you didn't know, our teens have teen camp a week from tomorrow. would encourage you to be praying for them, that uh, the Lord would minister to them as they gather in Batesburg. Uh, great campground in Batesburg. And looking forward to seeing what God does in their lives. Colossians chapter 1, if you found it. If not, we might even have it on the screen for you. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. First thought this morning, be thankful for those who sojourn with you, those who journey with you. One of my favorite times of year to mess with people on social media is the end of October, right before Halloween, before people start talking about their 30 days of Thanksgiving. Because during the 30 days of Thanksgiving, there are Thanksgiving legalists. They believe there should be an 11th commandment, thou shalt not celebrate anything to do with Christmas before the fourth Thursday of November. Because obviously, I don't know what they do if they are ever thankful for Jesus because you're not supposed to, 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 be, to celebrate the birth of Jesus before Thanksgiving. At least that's what the Thanksgiving purists say. So I like to mess with people and, uh, and joke with them because then you have the Christmas lovers who think that you should celebrate Christmas all year round and uh, they tend to butt heads with the Thanksgiving purists. It's not Thanksgiving. Believe it or not, the Bible still talks about giving thanks. So we are allowed, if it's not November, to give thanks. Yeah, that's good. So every once in a while, the, pa the Bible calls us to give thanks for people. And it, unfortunately, more often than not, the folks that we might l be the least likely to say thanks to are the folks who journey with us the closest just tends to be how life goes. 
And Paul is encouraging the people at Colossae to, to make sure that you are taking the necessary time to give thanks to the people who mean so much to you, the people who are journeying in life with you, the people who are walking step in step with this journey of following Christ together. How long has it been since you've told somebody that is journeying with Jesus with you that you appreciate them, that you're thankful for them, that you love them and care for them and are so blessed that they're a part of your life? Paul encourages us to do it. And it may not seem overtly spiritual. I came to church today to hear that I need to tell somebody thanks. Well, you did, because the Bible does. First thought this morning, make sure that you say thanks to the people who are especially close to you. The second thing is that we need to learn from proven Christ followers. Paul talks about this, uh, this Epaphras, this faithful, this faithful minister of the gospel. It is so critical, brothers and sisters, that we are opening the door of our heart to men and women who are speaking the truth of the gospel into our life. Sure, since teen camp is so relevant uh, to me at the moment, uh, I, I got a couple teen camp stories to share with you. The one is I was speaking about sanctification to our teenagers in Pittsburgh. And and I was prepared to share with them about sanctification. I asked them how many of them have been in the church at least since they had started the youth group and just over half raised their hands. I said, well, how many of you have been in the Church of the Nazarene for at least three years? Keep your hands up if you already have your hand up. And just over two-thirds, about 75% of the students that were at the camp, there are about 180 students there plus the staff, about, about three-quarters of them raised their hand, been in a church of the Nazarene for at least three years. When I asked them, how many of you can remember anything that your pastor has said about sanctification, almost every hand went down. This is the defining doctrine of the church of the Nazarene. And yet, most of their hands went down. And when I asked them what they knew about sanctification, they didn't even get close when I asked them, is rebellion against God acceptable in the life of a Christian, the majority of them thought that was acceptable. Rebellion, acceptable, normative. Uh, I wasn't prepared for that. Uh, it threw that whole session off. I, I felt like of all the sessions that were down there, that was the one I did the worst in because I wasn't prepared for that. I, I would have prepared a totally different trajectory if I would have known that they came to teen camp thinking that God is a, it finds rebellion against him the acceptable norm. We must make sure, brothers and sisters, that we are allowing people to speak into our life the words of Scripture that are true and everlasting, not contemporary and popular. There's a lot of stuff out there in our world today that is popular and is being propagated as from Jesus. My friends, we have to watch who we allow speak into our life. Epaphras demonstrates that he was a faithful minister of the gospel. Who are we allowing to speak into our life? Do those individuals lead us into a deeper understanding of who Jesus is, that our lives are a more accurate reflection of Jesus, that, that we are living into the kingdom of God and, and joining him there, or, or are the Christians that are speaking into our life calling, calling us to settle for a second-class version of Christianity? Who we allow to speak into our life is so critical to our spiritual well-being, we must learn from those who are faithful to the witness of Jesus Christ. The third thing that Paul mentions here is that prayer is critical to fruit-bearing. Prayer is critical to fruit-bearing. There's a story of a child who always got in trouble. It wasn't me. And, and he, 
he, he always got, got in trouble. And, you know, his parents tried spanking. They tried timeouts. They tried lots of different things, and nothing was working. So they decided that they would try to send their child to his room and, and ask them to pray. Maybe God could help this kid. So if we send our child to the room for timeout, we, we want you to take this time during timeout, and we want you to talk to God about your behavior. So they, they committed to that before too long. Uh, the kid re- was bad, and they sent him to his room for a timeout. After the appropriate amount of time, mom goes into the room, and she sits down on the bed, and she said, did you pray? And he said, I did. And she said, well, what did God tell you about your behavior? He said, my behavior? I wasn't praying for me. I was praying for you. I I was praying that God would help you learn how to put up with me. (laughs) Prayer is not about trying to convince God uh, of what it is that he should do for us. Prayer is about aligning our heart with the heart of God. It's about, it's about giving God an opportunity to speak into our life. Yes, there's a, there, yes, God wants to know what it is that we want. The Bible says that we should ask with boldness. But, but as, as, as I understand prayer, the best part of prayer is not trying to convince God to do something that I want him to do. The best part about prayer is entering into this conversation with God whereby my will submits and surrenders to his, whereby my heart discovers his heart and enters into the flow of his grace as he and I talk to each other. This is prayer. And because this is prayer, this is critical to fruit bearing as a Christian. Because if I'm not entering into the heart of God for my life, if I'm not entering into the understanding of what it is that God wants to do in my life, then how in the world am I going to to bear effective fruit that honors Jesus when all, all I'm doing in prayer is trying to convince God to do my thing? Paul says that prayer is critical to fruit bearing and we won't get to effective fruit bearing if if our prayer life is not centered into the discovery of what it is that God wants to do in us and through us. Prayer opens the door of my heart to discover what it is that he wants to do. I I thought of a, a... Yesterday on the flight home, there was this beautiful couple with a small child a year and a half, and and he and I played peekaboo a little bit uh, after he woke up from a nap. His mom and dad were chuckling. Man, I, I, after I, after, as I was preparing for this message again, I, I thought, man, I could have talked about, opened up a spiritual door by talking about this beautiful family and what a great kid that they have. And I, I could have opened a door there. I missed it. Um, Obviously, it, I don't think that I missed it in the sense that it was inside the will of God. If it was inside the will of God, he would have made it clear. But prayer helps us to live life on the edge of our seat, to see what it is that God wants to do to, to, to invite us into his beautiful plan for that day. Prayer is essential to fruit bearing. And the last thought I have this morning is that Paul shares with his people that we've been delivered from darkness and have been invited into the kingdom that he is currently building on this planet. This is, this is like crazy radical stuff. We've been delivered from darkness, delivered from darkness, delivered from darkness. Over and over again I see in scripture that we have been set free from all unrighteousness, delivered from from rebellion. We have been invited into this kingdom with Jesus. Monday, I arrived at the campground in Pittsburgh, on Pittsburgh District at about noon, and um, I, met, I met a young lady about 21 years old. Her name's Kayla. She was going, is going to one of the local colleges and She's uh, taking courses in, in like hotel management, customer service. I, I didn't know there was a degree like that, but she, she feels passionate about customer service. And so she had to take an internship as a part of her education. And uh, so she was 
looking up places where she might have an internship, and she found the Pittsburgh District Campground, called the director and said, could I intern with you? And uh, so they set up this internship. And now comes teen camp. Uh, the director is the district, the campground director is the district and Y president. I know her very well. And um, she told her intern, I don't want you to do anything this week except hang out with me. And so on Monday night was the first time in her life where she ever heard a reading from the Bible. She'd never been in church her entire life. Never heard anything about Jesus. Didn't even know that the Bible was called the Bible. Had no understanding of what, she actually called this, that book. That's all she knew. Knew nothing. She hears these teenagers singing and raising their hands to Jesus. And she's like, what is going on here? And then she heard about this Jesus who can take that which is dead and bring it to life. And she went forward to pray. And she was sobbing at the altar and she got up and she said, I don't know what happened. She, she, there was no language to define it. There was, no under, there was nobody that she knew that had ever experienced what she experienced. So on Tuesday night, she went back to the altar again. And on Wednesday night, she went back to the altar again. And it wasn't until Wednesday that she was able to say, I've been transformed by Jesus. And Thursday night, we talked about the call to ministry and that God calls men and women, sets them apart for pastoral ministry, and that God also wants those who are not called to ministry to see themselves as ministers of the gospel in their particular profession. We got to pray for a kid who feels called to photography. I got to pray for a young man who feels called to work as a nur in the nursing home uh, area. I got to pray for somebody who feels a call to be a history teacher in high school. And uh, she went forward to consecrate her call to the Lord. On Friday night, the title of the message was Surviving the Local Church. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of feedback about that one. <laughs> they live streamed it because people were talking about it on the district. What's he going to say on this Friday night on Surviving the Local Church? 24% of our Nazarene churches have no teenagers in them. In the Pittsburgh district, it's almost a third. That's not good. And so I talked to the teens about what do you do in, in the context of your local church. I told them, you don't need the church board's permission to go love and serve people in Jesus' name. She went forward again because she began to see what it is that God might be calling her to do. And after the service was over, she was literally jumping up and down, pumping her fists, saying, I know hundreds of people that were like me on Monday morning. There's darkness inside, but they can have light. There was sin inside, but they can have forgiveness. They, they, they're lost inside, but they can have Jesus. And she was bouncing up and down, and, and she's, she was going from adult to, to adult. You, you got to tell people about Jesus. You got to tell people about Jesus. He, can I pray for you so that you'll tell people about Jesus? She was going, she was going, whew. It was remarkable. I've never seen somebody so ignorant about Jesus on Monday be so transformed by Jesus by Friday. It's miraculous. Why is it <laughs> that our Christian maturation takes that away? When did we lose that? He, the creator of the heavens and the earth, says, Terry, 
I'm doing a radical, amazing thing on this planet. While everybody else is complaining about what it is that's going on in America these days, I am in America building my kingdom. And the gates of hell is not going to pre pre prevail against that kingdom. And I am looking across this nation to find men and women who would receive my invitation and go in my name. When did we lose it? I'm here to tell you, brother and sister, we can find it again. This Jesus calls us and invites us into the kingdom and the kingdom of darkness no longer reigns in us. We've been transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. The kingdom of the beloved son. <laughs> Kayla, I'll never forget that gal. She said, <laughs> this is a quote, I've got to memorize that book. That's so what she said. I got to memorize that book. I said, start with the Gospel of John. I said, fall in love with Jesus there. Don't worry about going anywhere else until you, until you drink in and digest the, just read it over and over again. Fall in love with Jesus. She said, okay, I'll do that. My friends, we've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. And he invites us into this kingdom of Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. A beautiful invitation. And Paul reminds the church at Colossae of this beautiful invitation to enter into this kingdom of the beloved son. Thank somebody. Thank them for being so important, significant to you. Make sure that the people that are speaking into your life are, are, are pointing you to Jesus. Let prayer be, a, be an opportunity to, to make sure that your heart is in line with your Father and live in the flow of the kingdom of the beloved Son. Father, thank you for Paul's message to the church. And thank you for Paul's message to us. Father, thank you for transforming Kayla. Father, forgive me for, for making Christian maturity something that is boring and lifeless. May the process of discipleship in our life never rob us of the joy and the passion of the invitation to join Jesus in his kingdom. May your passion rise up in us this week as we live in the flow of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.